Welcome to the Pearl 72 and today we have a job to do because we're going to take it out for a sea trial and show you guys what it's like to drive but it also has an event to go to so we're taking it from the River Hamble in Southampton down to Lymington which is great because it gives us a nice bit of slow river work on the Hamble then we can have a nice blast west down the Solent and then we can drop the anchor and I can show you some of the features on board this boat and let me tell you there are many many features to enjoy and then we're back into Lymington for the end of the day. So come with us for a nice A to B trip on the Pearl 72, one of the most innovative boats in this sector. Let's get going. I'm Jack Haynes, welcome to Yacht Buyer. So these are very much first impressions. We've just come out of Swanwick Marina, we're heading down the Hamble, and I'm just familiarizing myself with the setup here. I'm perching on the edge of my seat because it's wet, but it does slide forward, so I could sit back if I wanted to, but I'm keeping my bum dry. And effectively, it's a very nice, clean layout. And for subscriber Cookie Monster, who said that I might mention the MFDs being a bit too far away, well, they're not too bad, actually. They are a little bit of a stretch if you're sitting back in the seat, but perching like I am now, I've got really nice, great view, easy control. As I said, when I toured this boat at Fort Lauderdale, you can watch that video if you want to, I'll put a link up there. The only thing that lets us side down a little bit at both helms is these MTU screens. They just look so dated compared to everything else these days. But of course, you can get your end information running through the Garmin screens as well. But yeah, first impressions up here anyway are pretty good. But of course, we won't really find out how it all fits together until we get it up to speed. So let's do that. Now the weather is all over the place today, so I've taken the opportunity while it's not actually raining to come up here and drive from the flybridge. And though it's not the most pleasant of conditions, it's a really, really pleasant experience. A lot of that is down to these larger MTU engines. You can have MAN 1400 or 1550 horsepower, but these MTUs just offer such smooth, gutsy performance. The amount of torque on offer, you know, this is obviously a big, heavy boat, but they make light work of getting it up onto the plane and it settles into this lovely 25 knot cruise which is what we're doing now you've got a range of about 250 nautical miles but even if you go flat out at 32 knots you'll still do over 200 nautical miles drop it back to 10 knots you've got a 4,000, just over 4,000 litre fuel capacity so you're looking at just under 600 nautical miles at 10 knots and of course you can cover a lot of ground like that and a lot of people do conserves fuel it's more comfortable the sea keeper is an option but that will still be having an effect at that speed so it makes a lot of sense to travel at those speeds when you're not in a rush but when you want to get somewhere like we do now so we can go and do the photo shoot 25 knots up here feels absolutely lovely i haven't got a huge amount of protection from the windscreen as you can probably tell i've got a fair bit of breeze in my face on a warm day in the med that'll be absolutely fine not quite as pleasant today and i've mentioned a bit about the the hound geometry it works really well actually it's clean and, and simple you've got everything you need under your fingertips i like the fact that you've got some storage solutions over here i've got some cup holders to my right as well the throttles come out on a plinth so they fall to hand really easily yeah it's a nice configuration it's lacking some charging up here there's no induction charger there's no usbs either so you can do with that just to add you a bit of functionality so you can charge your devices but yeah it's a nice spot to drive the boat from if a bit cold today what about the handling? Because it's up here where you can really enjoy that with the sound of the sea and weight pouring out behind you. Well, I have to say, what I like is that actually on the straight and narrow, she sits really nice and stable and will have lost a bit of the effect of the sea keeper at this speed. So you are relying more on the boat's natural stability and it sits dead straight, doesn't wander about. It's really nice. But when you do want to turn it, it's got a lovely mix of feedback quite obedient heel as well you know it's a big boat but actually it responds really nicely to the helms person's inputs and it's a very nice spoke to thread from side to side now this hull is getting no challenge out here today yes the rain is not so good but the sea conditions are pretty much bang on uh, it's very calm but it's a lovely sure footed feeling boat and it settles into a lovely running attitude as well we have got the Humphrey interceptor system on this boat as well, which is constantly maintaining the trim to make sure you've got the nicest running attitude. And that's working brilliantly because I'm not having to think about the trim at all. I'm just setting the speed 
and making sure we're going in the right direction. It's a very easy, relaxing boat to drive at higher speeds. It is rather cold though, so let's go downstairs and drive from the lower half. Down here at the lower helm, the most noticeable thing is you don't feel like you're at a cramped, cooped up lower helm because there's so much natural light down here. The extended windscreen that Pearl used just bathed this whole area in natural light, so it does feel lovely and bright. You've probably noticed that the steering wheel is set more centrally. Two reasons for that. I think it puts you more central so you have a better view forward. But also, if the steering wheel was this side, this mullion on the windscreen here would create more of a blind spot. You don't get that so much being here in this position. Of course, the only downside is that the navigator will disturb the skipper as they move out of this area, but there is a side door so they can get out of the deck and around the boat that way. And of course, that also makes communication for the skipper a lot easier as well. The helm, it's a nice, stylish looking dash design. Again, you have the twin MFDs. You can have bigger MFDs at both helms, actually, and I probably would go for that. But it's nice to have them split so you can split the information that's presented to you. Again, the slightly dated MTU screens let the side down a little bit, but they do relay a useful amount of engine information. Then you, I like upstairs, you've just got that rocker switches of things you're going to use regularly, your bilge pumps, your lights, your anchor windscreen wipers. They're all really easy to get to. It's a really pleasant place to drive the boat from. But as I said, away from the helm, there's loads of features to show you. So let's pull over in Allen Bay, drop the hook and show you what I mean. Let's start back here then, because this is where a lot of the innovation on board the 72 really lives. This challenge for Bill Dixon to get a tender garage on this size boat where you can fit a Williams 345 and a jet ski side by side with room for a sea bob and he's done it it's all packed in there and then you have the hydraulic platform which obviously drops down into the water then you have a runner system for both toys that help you launch them down into the water and then for thirty-nine thousand pounds you can have these optional side platforms which fold down from the side here and just give you a little bit more real estate down here at the waterline than you would ordinarily have I think they work pretty well. I think they work better if they had some pop-up cleats in them so you could tie the toys and the tender off here, which would then keep the area behind the main platform clear. But they are a nice addition and really pretty unique in this market. Now, the compromise for that really wide garage is that this passageway on the port side is slightly narrower than the one on the starboard side. But crucially, I can still come up this side so you do have access into the cockpit from both sides and it's a cleverly worked space. And that's mainly down to these split tables, which just make it so much more functional because you can have them in this sort of chilled coffee table setup where you still have room to walk between them and people aren't trapped on the bench. But obviously they both open up, got supports under here. They open up, meet in the middle and they both go up and down as well. So they really are very flexible and just add to the versatility of this space. Elsewhere here, underneath this counter, you have a sink and then there's a bin underneath. Again, just gives you a little bit more flexibility. It means if you need to wash your hands, you don't have to go inside the saloon to the galley. The other thing we have here, apart from the fusion repeater there for the stereo system, is the third control station. It's an option, but certainly if you're in the Mediterranean, it's a really good one. You cannot see the aft end of the boat from the flybridge or, of course, from the lower helm. So having this here, where you can spot the back of the boat really easily, works really well. You've got bow and stern thruster, you've got your throttles and engine stop start as well. All neatly tucked down under there. The last thing to talk about in this area is boarding gates. Both sides just means if you're at a high sided dock, then you can easily get off either side without having going down the platform. We carry on up the port side deck, we go past access to the cruise space. We'll of course have a proper look at that and the engine room later on in the tour. And then we pick up this lovely bit of design detail here. It's got a really striking profile, this boat. A lot of that is to do with the glass and the lovely shape of the hard top. We've also got this nice clear gunnel here. Not only does it just break up the fiberglass, but of course it maintains the view. You've got these lovely big windows. There's no point blocking that off with fiberglass. So you've got these nice see-through areas. Works really, really nicely. And it's an easy boat to move around on. As you can see, I can walk very comfortably down these decks. There's a little step up onto the foredeck. And then we have another really great 
living area and it's practical as well as sociable. We've got pop-up lights, built-in cup holders, nice big storage voids on both sides, perfect for chucking your lines in there. And then you've got to step up onto the Portuguese bridge. So it's not flush, but that is what is giving you the excellent headroom in the owner's cabin below. Again, something we'll of course look at later. Sunbathing space here. This table again is on an actuated leg, so that will raise up to become a dining table or a drinks table if you want to have drinks and snacks up here. Of course, you've got your built-in sofa. You've got another repeater for the Fusion Stereo system, so you can control your music from up here. And then we drop down and right forward, of course, you've got your, your mooring gear, your ground tackle, and two nice big anchor lockers. All really nicely finished. I love these fair leads. The quality of stainless steel is absolutely wonderful. Let's go to the flybridge. Up to the top deck. And this is a really nice space. There's a nice mix of fixed and freestanding furniture. You have space off, some freestanding chairs and a table. Then this nice fixed sun pad, which is pushed over to one side. And this has got a really useful amount of storage underneath it. In fact, we've got all of the covers for all this seating all fit under there, which is really handy. I mean, you don't have to go downstairs to try and pack covers away. Incidentally, there's an awning that pops out of here to give you some shade over this area if you want it. Another repeater for the stereo system there. A couple of cup holders. Yeah, this is a really nice spot. And I like the design of the bar as well. It's big, substantial, lots of serving space. This little raised area, so you can line your drinks up. And you've got the usual array of bits here. Top loading fridge, fridge and ice maker underneath, sink, grill, all the stuff that you need to serve your guests. who will be sitting opposite in this dinette here, which has got a fixed table. I do like the stainless inserts though. I think they look really smart. And they're beneath, this really chunky hardtop. Now there are a few options with the hardtop. A standard is just a fixed roof. You can have as a cost option, a canvas roof, traditional big canvas roof that pulls back, or this vein roof, which I didn't really use to understand. Why did you just want slats, which would leave shadow all over the deck? But this is the first one I've seen where you have the veins, but it also fully opens and leaves a wind deflector forward. So this is quite a good arrangement, but it is a 90 grand option. There's quite a lot of engineering in it though, so you can see what you're paying for. But yeah, quite a cool solution. As is this spot here, because this is it in sort of coffee table dining mode. Obviously, you've got a couple of forward facing seats here as well. So you can have a couple more people joining the journey, looking forward when the boat's moving. But this, as for pretty much every other table, is on an actuated leg. So that will then drop down. You've got a cushion that goes in there. So you have another sun pad here underneath the sunroof. Really cool use of space. And then of course you have your twin helm station. So that's the deck spaces. Let's go and have a look at this really pretty unique Kelly Hoppen interior. Let's head inside then. Star Trek style doors on this boat. You can have a center as well. So if your crew carrying plates or the owner carrying plates, it will open automatically. Works fantastically now. I do wonder in sort of 10 years time, whether that might feel like an overcomplication, but for now, I'm liking the feel and I'm liking the feel inside here as well. The Kelly Hoppen influence is clear for everybody to see really. And the design of the furniture, the beautiful lighting, especially overhead. I love this use of indirect lighting up here, the lamps up on the wall. It just looks and feels totally different to anything else in this sector really. Now as a no cost option, you have the standard modern interior, which is light woods. Then you can pay 30,000 pounds to have the luxury interior, which is darker woods and you can have them in satin and in gloss. But this is the indulgent interior designed specifically for this boat. Again, it's a 30,000 pound option, but it, it is the option that really gives you the wow factor that does separate this boat apart from anything else, really. I like the fact things like they've left the TV there. It's not another pop-up mechanism and they've made something of it. So it's framed. You've got this nice framework behind the TV. So it looks like it's floating and you've got storage underneath. You've got storage at eye level. You've got really easy access to the switching panel right by the door. When you come in and out, it's just there, just where you need it. So yes, it's incredibly clean and stylish and modern, but it's practical as well. These do look like hard edges. I appreciate that, but actually they are softened. So they won't give you too much of a dig if you do bump into them when you're at sea. You feel a little bit lost here. There's not much to grab onto. Could maybe do with a, a nice handle up here to grab onto, but obviously once you're towards the galley, You've got this lovely solid countertop that you can steady yourself on. And I love the fact that the galley 
it's almost floating over the water. We've seen the effect here of those glass balustrades on the outside. So I'm here in the kitchen, but I still have this great connection to the water. And it's just wonderfully light in here, even better forward, as we'll see in a second. And this is incredibly cool, clean, that terrible cliche, New York loft apartment, but it does feel like that. I like this lighting design as well. But again, you've got the functionality. You've got your chopping board that sits on the sink. You've got storage, dedicated storage for the boat's crockery down here. There's a dishwasher, induction hob with ventilation built in. My cooker down here, you've even got an induction charger for your mobile phone tucked over here and the wine cooler in the counter. That's a pretty cool touch. The only thing that's a little bit of a pain is that the fridge is on the other side of the saloon, but it's a good size. It's you know, obviously full height, decent freezer below as well. And they've worked in a little pantry here as well with adjustable sliders. So again, it's all very clean and neat, but it's well thought out as well. Down here, you've got all the stemware tucked away, the bar stools. So this will become you know, a nice drink spot at night. In the morning, it's a lovely place to sit and have breakfast. Because again, you sit here and I've got a lovely view out over the water. You have got a great connection to the sea from inside this boat, which is obviously the whole point of being on a boat. Now in this sector, there's a split between boats that have their galleys amidships and aft. Princess Y72, Santiago Madhan 68, the galley is aft. Ferretti 720, the Azimut 72, it's a midship. So it really depends how you feel, what layout you like. And it's also got split access to the cabins. Again, something the Princess and the Sunseeker do. But on this one, forward access is the owner's cabin. And then the midships, you have access down to the guest cabins. We will, of course, look at both of those areas later on. And this is a really fantastic spot here on the main deck. Pearl do these extended windscreens. They've done them on loads of previous models and they work brilliantly. It's so lovely and light here. And again, it's just the connection to the outside. You still can take in your surroundings. You can see the needles beautifully from here. This all works really well. This is your dinette, obviously. It's a long way forward, but it is well connected to the galley. And I like that this is sort of extended sofa, a bit of a day bed, so you can chill out there, relax again with a nice view looking out after you've got these stools as well that you can move around anywhere really inside this salon so it is so so different to anything else it's not going to be to all tastes but it really does stand out right let's have a look at those cabins now most of this boat's rivals on the lower deck you have a companion ray pretty much running down the center line with the cabins working off it it's a different arrangement here this companionway is running across the boat and that's what is enabling Pearl to do the sort of two master cabin thing that they talk about. And we'll have a look, closer look at that. I'd say one of the compromises is that this area does feel a little bit cramped. I think the payoff, as you'll see, is the cabin spaces. Because if we go this way, we're actually heading amidships now, we're into what Pearl would turn the second master cabin. It is the VIP, but it is amidships. It's nearly full beam. You have the bathroom on this side, but actually that works really well. It gives you a good amount of space with a separate shower cubicle. But that aside, it does feel like a master cabin. You've got the nice centrally mounted bed, so you can use normal sheets and bedding. It's completely flat, so you can walk around it and get in and out of bed really easily. As you can see, I'm six foot tall and I've got loads of space above my head. You have the bureau over there, the lovely Kelly Hoppin detailing of the, the two layer side table here. You've got repeater switches for the lighting plus air -con controls. And I like the way that these reading lights come on and off as they pop in and out of those little recesses. It's really lovely stuff. And then the other thing you have is if I cross over the other side, now this would probably be a twin on most of this boat's rivals, but because you have this geometry down here, this feels like another mini stateroom. Again, you haven't got quite as much width, of course, but you can still walk all the way around the bed. The bed is a relatively normal shape and a good size. Even more headroom in here than over there in the VIP and you still have those touch points from the VIP. I've got my bureau with my swiveling mirror. You have in both cabins the television mounted inside the mirror, which is a really nice effect. A nice bit of hole window to get some natural light in here. And what I think really works and gives it that stateroom feel is this lovely ensuite. There's a step up into it, but again, headroom rockets up. Once again, I've got my shower cubicle there. It's a really luxurious guest cabin. And then finally, the last guest cabin, in this section of the boat, if we head across the boat, we're into what is a more formulaic twin, but a really nice one. Good sized berths here, 
nice amount of space between them so you can walk between the berths and get changed here. You can see the headroom and again the use of lighting is lovely. The mix of strip and spotlight works really well and you've got again all the same lovely detailing that you have in the bigger cabins and it's not a private ensuite but it is ensuite to the day head through here. There's another door in the companion way and that gives access to guests during the day. But this isn't of course the last bit of accommodation on this boat. We've got to go and have a look at where the owner sleeps. This is a nice bonus of this arrangement as well. You don't often get this nice foyer into your cabin on a boat of this size. And of course it benefits massively from having that double length windscreen above. So there's loads of natural light coming down here. You've got this shelving here where you can arrange your ornaments and then more storage space down there. But then come on in to the star of the show when it comes to sleeping space on board this boat. This is such a great arrangement. It works absolutely brilliantly. First of all, the space, the headroom, there is a luxury in empty floor space and there's plenty of it in this boat. And I mentioned it about the VIP cabin. Because the bed is a normal size, you can use normal bedding and you have the same amount of access either side. It's a really, really comfortable space. You have the bathroom tucked behind it and that works really nicely. There's access to that over on that side. And this is a cool little area as well. A little breakfast dinette, somewhere to maybe open your laptop, do a little bit of work. And then you have the television, not in a mirror in this cabin, but it pops up from there. Again, really good spot, very easy to see from the bed. And there is lots and lots of storage in here under the bed, around the sides at knee level, big hang wardrobe and shelving over there on the other side, another hang wardrobe here. If you wanna live on this boat for a long period of time, you certainly have the storage in this cabin to do so. And some other really nice touches of course, you've got your standard hull windows, both of which have got portholes. You can get some natural ventilation, but I really like the way they've worked in these skylights here at sort of above head level. Again, draws in lots of natural light. You can see the horizon, which is quite nice as well. You have a good view out. Again, not something you'd ordinarily benefit from. Again, more shelving and the Kelly hop and detailing. This lighting here, the indirect lighting throughout is lovely, but you really notice it in this cabin, especially the way it all runs under here under the cornicing. Absolutely lovely. It is beautifully executed. From here then, let's go and have a look at where the crew sleep. Now, given the geometry of the boat, you actually might think that the crew space is gonna be one of the sacrificial areas, but it's really not too bad. If you bear in mind that most of these boats are owner run, then I think the crew space is pretty good. It has a separate bathroom down here, which has a separate shower cube because so it's not just a wet room, they've got a sort of galley mess area that strangely doesn't have a sink, but I think that is something you can add. Of course, you've got a sink in the bathroom. There's a microwave up here, little fridge down here, and this is where the washer dryer is. So you have access to that, whether you're a guest or not, obviously, but the crew have good access to it down here. Crew are actually on board at the moment, and that's where their bunks are. We're not gonna go in there and pry into their personal space, but you've got a couple of bunks and you've got some storage space. And crucially, from within this area, direct access into the engine room. So here we are in the engine room and you'll notice this intrusion overhead. Well, that is the slot for the tender garage. And you know, part of the charm of this boat is having that big tender garage. So that's just one of those things that you're gonna have to live with really. You can still get between the engines okay. Obviously it's crouching room here. When you first come into the engine room, you can stand up fully. There's also an access hatch here. So this is straight into the cockpit. If you need to get down quickly in emergency or just wanna stick your head in and make sure everything's okay, you can do it from there. There are two generators on this boat. You've got them either on the either side of the engine room here. You can see them outboard, easy enough to get to. You've got to climb over these platforms, but you can get to them reasonably easily. Now the engines on this boat, you can have MAN 1400 or 1550s, which is what most of this boat's competitors have got. Sunseeker will fit IPS to the Manhattan 68. This particular boat has got the largest MTU 1,600 horsepower engines, and they are big old lumps. So they do take up a bit more space in this engine room, but they are lovely motors. On that note, let's fire them up and head into Livington. How much does the 72 cost then? The base price is 2.42 million pounds, excluding VAT, with the 1,400 horsepower MAN engines. Our test boat, however, had some key upgrades, including the MTU engines, second 20.5 kilowatt generator, indulgence interior, the hardtop with the tilt main sunroof, the upgraded Garmin nav equipment, medspec air conditioning, and a Seakeeper SK18. 
With those extras and some other bits, the price it's tested was £3.37 million, excluding VAT. We're approaching Limington now, so it seems a good time to talk about slow speed handling, which is very good. One of the lovely byproducts of these MTUs is you've got a lovely amount of bite in and out of gear. So even if you just got the wheel centered, you're using the throttles to move the boat around, it's really positive and you get a nice quick reaction if you need to twist the boat, spin it, maneuver it in and out of position. You've got balanced stern thrust as well. This boat's got the standard thrusters. You can upgrade to proportional hydraulic ones, which I would advise just gives you a bit more power. It gives you a bit more longevity when it comes to the thrust. And it also has a function where you can hold the boat against the pontoon. So if you as a skipper need to get out or you're single handed, then you can hold the boat on the pontoon and, and help out with the lines. You have a suite of cameras on board. So even berthing down here, you have a view of the aft platform if you want to do it from down here. but that's really where that third station comes in particularly useful. It's not just in the Mediterranean as well. There are situations in the UK or elsewhere where it's nice to be able to berth the boat from a position in the cockpit. But ultimately, I think if you're an experienced two-person crew, you could have on this boat without an extra crew member. Well, the light is fading fast on our review of the Pearl 72, but we've got ourselves here to Limington. And this boat really caught our eyes when it was launched back at Fort Lauderdale, of course, for its brilliant packaging, the tender garage, the formation of the accommodation, but none of that means anything if it can't do the business out of sea. But what today has proved is that it most certainly can. This is an incredibly refined, relaxed, poised cruiser, whether you're cruising at 10 knots or up to 30, it really does feel like it can do the business. The Pearl 62 is one of the most popular boats that Pearl has ever built. I don't think this one will be far behind it. Thank you very much for watching that video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do want to watch the full tour of the boat from Fort Lauderdale so you can see it in the sun, you can click on this box up here. If you want more sea trials from us, click down here. And if you'd like to subscribe to the Yacht Buyer channel, then please click up here. Thanks for watching.